This is a scripture that preachers often dread. For one thing, it's about money. And for another, it includes Jesus' most difficult commandment. To sell all that you have and give the money to the poor, thus rendering yourself poor in the process. But I'm actually not going to talk about money, because I think there's something more at stake here, something more important than material wealth, and that something is buried beneath Jesus' provocative question, why do you call me good? From the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, they were greatly astounded and said to one another, Well, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. I've always tried to be a good man. Not a great man, mind you, contrary to popular belief. That's... That's just a whole lot of pressure that I don't really need. But I'm a reasonably friendly person. I usually hold doors open for strangers, if not always for friends. I rarely touch the horn in my car unless it's to warn a flock of geese that I'm coming through. I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt if I'm at the store and the cashier shortchanges me. I usually let it slide. And if there's a long line of people standing behind me, I'll refrain from using coupons. I give to the church and other charities without worrying too much about the tax write-off. And speaking of which, I pay my taxes, more or less. I'm as good a man as the next guy in line, anyway. Maybe a little better. After all, I often find that The people I encounter when I'm out in public aren't always as gracious as I am. Even when pushing a stroller and carrying my fussy two-year-old son around, a lot of folks will just let the front door of the shopping mall swing closed in my face. And when I took him out for pizza the other day, just the two of us, we had to wait for ten minutes while the family in front of us, the family with five teenage daughters, had to bicker and debate about what they wanted on their pie. All the while, my son struggling to free himself from my loving arms and run amok in the pizza parlor. Frankly, I was a little annoyed that they didn't offer to let us go first. I mean, it's not that I have a sense of entitlement. It's not that I expect to be treated better than everyone else. I just expect my kid to be treated better than everyone else because that's how good a father I am. (laughs) My wife is also a very good mother and an honest and courteous woman, and she has little patience for those who lack her virtues. It's actually something of a running joke in our house. When we took our boy to the mall to see the Easter Bunny 
last week. Not one, but two couples brazenly cut in front of us in line. And by the time we got up to the front, our little boy was too upset to even look at the Easter Bunny. I hate people, my wife declared on the way back to the car, (laughs) seething. Why can't everyone be as nice as me? (laughs) Of course, if people are too courteous, that bothers her too. After a brief trip to the store the other day, she complained to me that no less than five sales associates asked her if she needed any help. Well, if I need that much help, she told me, I probably shouldn't be out by myself. (laughs) While I tend to have a little more faith in the human condition than she does, I will confess that I believe human beings are fundamentally selfish creatures. We have a tendency to put ourselves and the people that we love most before the needs of the total stranger. In his somewhat controversial book, Against Fairness. My colleague, Dr. Stephen Asma, argues that our tribal instincts, namely our commitment to ourselves and to our family and our immediate circle of friends, will always win out over our more democratic and civilized desire to treat everyone fairly. He opens the book with a rather shocking account of something that he said during a panel discussion on ethics. Leading into the microphone, he declared, I would strangle every person in this room if it would somehow prolong the life of my son. The room fell into a stunned silence. The Catholic priest to his left was horrified, and the radical communist at his right raised her hand to her mouth aghast at what he'd said. And that dramatic proclamation of his just goes to show how loaded the word good really is. Because while you might call someone who would kill 50 people with his bare hands to save the life of his son a good father, you might hesitate to call him a good man. So what is it at all that makes a person good. I'm driving home from work a couple of weeks ago, and I stop at a red light, because that's just the kind of person I am, (laughs) when I feel the sudden force of another vehicle slamming into my rear bumper. I'm a bit distracted at the moment as I'm singing along to an especially poignant tune on the car stereo, so I don't see the other car coming up behind me until it careens right into me. I just feel the crash and that startling lurch as my properly fastened safety belt does its thing. Did I mention that I always wear my (laughs) seatbelt? Sighing, I gesture with my right hand to the other driver, indicating that I'd like him to pull into a nearby driveway so that we can exchange insurance information. But to my shock, he puts his accelerator to the floor and drives right past me instead veering into oncoming traffic in his attempt to flee the scene. And just like that, he's gone. As I sit in the driver's seat, angry and stupefied, debating whether or not I ought to give chase, the car in front of me pulls off to the curb, and a young couple emerges, flagging me down. I can't believe that guy! the man says. He just crashed right into you and drove off. And he almost hit us trying to get away, his companion adds. Are you all right? I assure her that I am, and I walk behind my car to assess the damage. To my surprise, there's none. It certainly felt like a strong enough collision to leave a few dents, at least scratch the paint, but everything's fine. Hey, we took down the guy's license plate number if you want it, the man offers. You really should call the cops before he gets away. I thank him for taking the number down and for stopping to check on me as I punch the license plate number into my phone for later reference. Most people wouldn't have bothered, I tell him. Hey, no worries, friend. It's just common decency, he replies. Anyway, 
you really should call the police. I got to look at the guy. He was probably in his 50s, Hispanic, probably just an illegal. My thumbs are busy tapping away numbers, but when he says that, I stop. Now this is interesting, I think to myself. Seems our good Samaritan is a little bit prejudiced. After all, the word illegal in this context typically reveals a less than friendly attitude towards undocumented immigrants and workers. Some might even call it racist. And regardless, the tone of his voice said it all. Now, I don't want to get too political about this, but I find it very interesting that the helpful bystander in this story, the good guy, would say something like that. I returned to my car wrestling with a moral dilemma. Someone crashed into me and then drove off. I have his license plate number, and I have a cell phone. And I suppose I have a civic duty to report the crime. On the other hand, I wonder, what if this guy was actually right in his prejudiced assumption about the other driver? What if he is an undocumented immigrant with no insurance and no proof of citizenship? If I report him to the police, they'll probably chase him down, boot him out of the country. His livelihood could be ruined. His life could be ruined. And for what? With the phone in my hand, I have to decide how this is going to play out. Justice or mercy on the toss of a dime. There's an unwritten rule among preachers, and that it's that you should never put yourself out there as the hero of your own story. You've probably noticed that I tend to be pretty self-deprecating up here in the pulpit, and that's because I can't really indulge the alternative. I mean, no one here really wants to hear about the time that I rescued all those zoo animals from that terrible fire, <laughs> leading all of the monkeys out by the hand, to guiding them to safety. Stories like that always come off as narcissistic, no matter how you try to spin it. And they're disingenuous, even when they're true. Because most stories don't really have a hero, or a villain, for that matter. And the case of this hit-and-run incident illustrates this beautifully. Things here aren't so black and white. The Good Samaritan comes off as a little bit of a racist. And the criminal offender may well have been scared out of his mind. Now, I'm not going to make any assumptions about his citizenship or his nationality, but given his behavior, I will assume that he probably didn't have any insurance. The guy probably panicked, got scared and ran, probably sweating bullets all the way home. As for me, the third player in the tale, I decided not to call the police. I think that was the right thing to do, and I confess that I felt a certain amount of pride in my decision, proud of myself for taking the moral high ground. But it doesn't make me good. After all, if there had been serious damage or if my son had been in the back seat of my car, I know that I would not have been so forgiving. And for all I know, the guy could have been driving drunk. He could have been a deranged lunatic. And I just let him go. Sometimes there's just no recognizing good from bad. Not in other people, and least of all, in ourselves. Why do you call me good? Jesus asks. No one is good, but God alone. I mean, it's the last thing we expect Jesus to say, right? If Jesus isn't good then who is? And yet, you won't find many people out there who actually perceive themselves as bad. I mean, we all like to think of ourselves as decent human beings, right? We stop at traffic lights, pay our taxes, give to charity, so on and so forth. Most of us don't abuse our children. Most of us have never killed someone or committed a serious crime. 
We compare ourselves to our neighbors and we think, well, I'm at least as good as her. Maybe a little better. And I'm definitely better than him. The writer and theologian C.S. Lewis makes this very point in one of his books, and he argues that this logic is flawed. He writes, the very fact that you selected him for the comparison is suspicious. He's probably head and shoulders above you. So all of this begs the question, how can everyone go on believing that they're good people, even when we all do terrible things? Well, first off, I want to say that I believe this congregation is filled with what I would call good people. In fact, I've never met someone here that I would not call a good person, sins of the parking lot notwithstanding. (laughs) But believing that about ourselves is a dangerous assumption. In fact, I believe that a person is capable of doing terrible things precisely because she believes that she's a good person. When we get too comfortable in that assumption, then in our own minds, we can do no wrong. We can justify any behavior, any sin, any crime. We're always doing something for the greater good, or because we're following orders, or because it's not really hurting anyone. So we tell ourselves. And no matter what evil a person does, so long as he can cling to that fantasy that he's a good man, not great maybe, but good, then he's capable of committing even more heinous crimes. There aren't any nefarious, mustache-twirling villains roaming around out there, tying damsels to railroad tracks and laughing maniacally. In fact, the most evil among us often believe themselves to be doing the greatest good. Names like Hitler and Osama bin Laden come to mind. Wicked men who fancied themselves the saviors of their people. But Jesus, Jesus is a very different kind of savior. Jesus tells us right up front that he is not good that he's flawed, that he makes mistakes, which is more than we've ever gotten from any pope or politician who think themselves infallible. And because Jesus recognizes his own capacity for sin and temptation, he's better equipped to deal with it. In the same text, C.S. Lewis writes, when a man is getting worse, He understands his own badness less and less. A moderately bad man knows he is not very good. A thoroughly bad man thinks he's all right. This is common sense, really. You understand sleep when you are awake, not when you are sleeping. Jesus, unlike most of us, is awake fully aware of his own capacity for evil. Not so with this gentleman who comes to see Jesus, asking him what he must do to inherit eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. He actually seems like a pretty decent sort of guy, but he's a little full of himself. He basically tells Jesus that since he was a kid, he's done nothing wrong. He's always followed each of God's 613 commandments listed in the scriptures to the letter. And you get the sense that he's expecting to get a big thumbs up from Jesus, a green light to heaven. But instead, Jesus slaps him with the one test that he knows the man will fail. Sell all you have and give the money to the poor. Jesus himself admits that it's impossible. He wants to put this guy in his place to remind him that he's not as good as he thinks he is. And he's doing this for his own good. Not because Jesus hates the guy, but because he loves him. 
we're explicitly told in this text that Jesus loves him. Just as a father loves his wayward son. I've always tried to be a good man. And I'm trying to be a good father. But my goodness, or lack thereof, has never been more challenged, more tested, than my role as a parent. It's just so easy to get it wrong. It's so easy to spoil my kid or else accidentally traumatize him. I can't let myself get comfortable in this assumption that I'm a good father, lest I stop actually trying to be a good father. There's an old story about a man who worked very hard, worked very long hours, often late into the night. And one evening, as he was getting home just before his son's bedtime, his little boy asked him how much money he makes. Well, if you must know, the father replied wearily, I make about $30 an hour. Oh, the little boy said. Well, then perking up, he asked his father, Daddy, can I have $10? Absolutely not, the man snapped. Don't be so selfish. I work hard for my money. Now, go on and get to bed. He was furious. His son hadn't seen him all day long, and straight away he starts asking for money as though that were all he cared about. But after a little time passed, the man started to feel as though he'd maybe been a little too hard on his son. So he went upstairs and knocked on the boy's bedroom door and asked him if he's still awake. Look, I'm sorry, the man told him. It's been a very long day, and I took out my frustration on you. Here's the $10 you asked for. Oh, thank you, Daddy. The boy smiled, and he immediately tossed his pillow aside and pulled out a crumpled stack of dollar bills, adding the $10 to his collection. And seeing this, the man grew angry all over again. Well, if you've already got money, then why are you asking me for more? He scolded his son. Because I didn't have enough, the boy replied. But now I do. Here's $30, Dad. Can I buy an hour of your time? I know, it's a woefully sentimental tale. Like something you get in your email from that person who's always forwarding you, things like that. (laughs) But it just goes to show how easy it is to believe that we're the good guy in the story, that we've got it right, and that everyone else has it wrong, even our own children. And if we're capable of treating our own kids like that, what are we capable of doing to total strangers? It's so easy to tell ourselves that we're good. It's so hard to believe that we aren't. Why do you call me good? Perhaps that's a question that we all ought to be asking ourselves. Amen.